let's begin. Consider transitional rails, single column primary key as your favorite bicycle, commute bicycle. Simple, effective, perfect for a day-to-day -day commute. Much like an auto-incremented integer IDs. But what if you're planning a road trip that requires a much more capable uh, vehicle to complete it? This is where Rails 7.1 steps in with its native support for composite primary keys. Much like having an SUV in your garage, it's not a tool for your day-to-day -day use, but irreplaceable when it comes to representing complex relational data. Hi, everyone. I'm Nikita. I'm based in Ottawa. I'm a Ruby on Rails developer. Uh, I'm an open source contributor, and I'm part of the Rails triage team. I work at Shopify, and I'm part of the Rails, Ruby on Rails infrastructure team, where I led the effort to introduce native support to composite primary keys to Rails. Uh, we have our booth here at the conference. Come chat with us, uh, ask any questions if you have any problems with Rails, open issues, or questions about the presentation. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to cover the fundamentals of composite primary keys, uh, discover the composite primary keys in multi-tenant applications, we'll draw some parallels when it comes to sharding, uh, implementing sharding in a multi-tenant application, and we'll finish with revealing the uh, Active Record 7.1 support for composite primary keys. Let's begin with fundamentals. Here I'd like to cover the definition of a composite primary key, a real-world use case, and considerations when and why you might use it in your application. But before I begin, I want to underscore that having the capability to utilize composite primary keys doesn't necessitate its use in every use case. The decision to use uh, composite primary keys should be driven by your database schema design, and when decision to use them on the database level is made, you can rest assured Rails will be there to support it. Uh, so, composite primary key is a type of a primary key that is made up of two or more columns that uniquely identify a row in the table. They play a crucial role in database schema designs when it comes to representing complex relationships that cannot be represented with a single column primary key. Uh, in this example, we have a student courses table identified by student ID and the course it's taken. Let's quickly go through a real world examples of entities that can potentially be represented by a combination of its properties. For example, a car entity can be identified by a combination of make, model, and its year. A book can be identified by a combination of author and its title. However, it's important to note that uh, while these examples show the utility of composite primary key, it doesn't mean real. you have to model these concepts in your real application. The decision should be based on specifics of the data you're working on and your schema design. Composite primary keys is just a tool in your toolbox, and as any tool, you should be using it when appropriate. However, let's turn our attention to a much more practical use case for a composite primary key, a join table. Join tables are a natural fit for a composite primary key. By using a composite primary key made up of two foreign keys to two related entities, we can ensure that we are uniquely representing a single relationship. Let's consider a real-world example, uh, a blogging system. In our system, we'll typically have a blog post table, a tags table, and to represent the relationship between blog posts and tags, we will have a join table, which will represent many-to-many -many relationships where blog posts can have many tags and single tag can be associated with many blog posts. In this table, a uh, combination of tag ID and blog post ID are uniquely representing uh, an association, which makes it a perfect use case for a composite primary key. When it comes to actually defining a composite primary key, we have two choices, whether to put tag ID up front or blog post ID uh, up front. Uh, to choose one over another, it's important to consider types of the queries you're gonna be making. If you're most frequently interested in uh, blog posts, attached to a single tag, you'll most likely favor the tag ID being up front. However, if you're, in most cases, you're interested in tags attached to a specific blog post, you'll favor the blog post ID being up front. 
All right. In this uh, section, we covered that join tables are most likely the most natural fit for a composite primary key when they represent uh, a many-to-many -many relationship. Not all concepts are suitable for composite primary keys in a relational database. Uh, and use of composite primary key should be driven by database schema design and not just the fact that Rails started to support it. Uh, next, let's talk about the composite primary keys in multi-tenant applications. Uh, this section will look at Shopify Monolith as an example of a multi-tenant application. Uh, see how changing a primary key to a composite primary key on certain tables impacts performance. Uh, and also we'll look at the trade-offs we had to make when we switched certain tables to a composite primary key. Before that, I'd like to remind you about one of the implicit Rails convention, that all tables by default, by default automatically will have an auto-incremented uh, integer ID column, which means for a typical Rails application, most data is stored on the disk strictly in the order the rows were created. For most tables in most applications, this makes a lot of sense and makes it easier for application developers to understand. However, in case of Shopify, there is an additional layer of organization. Every record at almost every table uh, belongs to a certain tenant, which means uh, every record in the table is semantically associated with a particular online store. This association is facilitated through the addition of a tenant key column uh, named shop ID in every tenant-related table. On this slide, records are colorized based on their association to a particular shop. In some cases, the pattern of row access in a table can significantly differ from a pattern of uh, records insertion. In case of Shopify, uh, records are insert, inserted. Uh, in case of Shopify, using a sequential uh, flat uh, single column primary key, records are inserted into a database uh, that belong to uh, multiple shops, uh, which makes the insertion really fast. However, when it comes to selecting selecting records that belong to the same shop, uh, it makes it complex due to records intervening in between, like in the example. Uh, switching, the, switching the single column primary key to a composite one changes the data layout on the disk. Uh, grouping the records together by its association to a specific shop, making the selection uh, much more simpler. The, Data layout on the disk is out of the scope of this presentation, so let me introduce you to a simplified explanation of this concept, uh, a bookshelf. Uh, imagine a bookshelf where books are organized uh, in order where they were purchased. Inserting records uh, or adding books to our bookshelf is fairly straightforward. You just find the name to slot and append the book there. This is really similar to appending records to a into a table with a single column out incremented primary key. But if you're asked to find books that belong to the same author, it becomes much more complicated. Uh, and even if you have a secondary index that tells you each location of a book, you still have to go through, uh, through multiple shelves to pick them one by one. This process can be time consuming and inefficient. Now let's uh, consider a different type of organization of our book shelves. Imagine a bookshelf where the books are organized by the author. Uh, selecting books in this case uh, is pretty straightforward. You just need to find the section where the books are stored that and belong to the same author and the, every record will be on the same shelf, making the selection pretty simple. However, when it comes to inserting a book, the, this operation takes a little bit more time because before uh, adding a new book, you at least have to find the section for a specific author. Uh, let's let's uh, extend our analogy a little bit further. Imagine now the books are not just grouped by the authors, but also squashed uh, to preserve some space. In this scenario, inserting book becomes even more complicated because before, uh, in addition to choosing the section for a specific author, we often need to make space for a new book to be added, while selection of the books are still simple because we only need to locate a 
specific uh, part of our bookshelf. Th this is applies to the, the uh, tables in the databases. So we, when we applied this principle to Shopify Monolith, uh, we saw uh, a drastic improvement in elapsed query times. Uh, the most commonly used queries were performing five, time, five to six times better. Uh, we maintain a slow query logs. We saw an 80% reduction in slow queries to a particular table that switched the composite primary key. Uh, the, the remaining uh, slow queries became 10 times faster and the overall time uh, taken by slow queries also dropped. In addition to some extreme cases where the performance jumped significantly, but those were for unique and low volume queries. There is one notable downside on performance that is was worth clearing, uh, calling out. We observed roughly 10 times degradation on inserts. Uh, however, it was a worthwhile trade-off because most of our data is queried much more frequently than being inserted. However, if in, if in your system insertion rate is essential, you might not consider using composite primary key for this particular table. Okay, let's recap the concepts. Database table in a multi-tenant application can often benefit from the use of composite primary keys uh, when you include the tenant key uh, in the composite primary key. Altering the primary key to a composite one will most likely enhance the performance of bulk inserts and updates. However, that comes at the cost of uh, slow down insertion rate. Uh, so for applications where the speed of data insertion is essential, using composite primary key might not be the best option. Okay, let's reveal some similarities with, uh, between uh, composite primary key and tenant-based sharding. Tenant-based sharding is a strategy employed to scale multi-tenant applications like Shopify Monolith. Uh, in this approach, data is partitioned uh, by shards based on the tenant ID, resulting in application data spread across multiple database instances. It's crucial that the data that belongs to the same tenant must live uh, on the same shard. Uh, so in this presentation we'll cover, we'll look at two uh, high level designs of sharding. Uh, the one on the left implies that the sharding solution lives within application. We actually heard an example at this conference, for example, uh, solid cache is the one that lives within application and chooses the shard to put and read data from based on the uh, hash key. Uh, I just was uh, in the talk from Miles from Intercom where he cleanly explained their approach to multi-tenancy and they were also choosing the shard based on the uh, application, the current context. That's all applied to the d design on the left. Design on the uh, right assumes that the sharding solution is a standalone solution. Application connects to it as if it was a regular database and the sharding solution itself uh, decides which shard to query or put data uh, to. In our presentation, we'll focus on the one on the right, the standalone uh, solution. Uh, and this solution imposes one important requirement on the application, is that it expects the tenant key, the sharding key, to be always present in the SQL queries to avoid scattering the queries across all shards and uh, directly route it to an appropriate shard based on tenant key. You might have noticed that uh, composite primary key and tenant-based sharding have very similar SQL requirements. They both uh, expect uh, two or more columns to be present in SQL, whether it's uh, your uh, unique association or uh, a tenant key. Uh, so implementing a composite primary key may be seen as foundational for tenant-based sharding, while absolutely not necessary. Though by including a tenant ID in the primary key, you're already referring your da data on per tenant basis, uh, basically separating uh, the data that belongs to different uh, tenants. Uh, implementing composite primary key by including the tenant key in it may simplify the further transition to uh, tenant-based sharding. Uh, so. Uh, one of the examples of a standalone solution is Vitesse that is used by GitHub and Shopify, which I won't be able to cover in depth. Um, so let's recap. Uh, 
models using composite primary keys and tenant shared models both typically include multiple columns in queries. Uh, and implements on composite primary keys may be a foundational, but not necessary step towards a sharding strategy. All right, let's overview active record support for composite primary keys. Um, this section will look how to define a composite primary key model, uh, how to work with, with this model, uh, and how to define a virtual primary key, along with revealing some limitations or recommendation what not to do when it comes to using composite primary key keys. Uh, for, for our example, imagine a model called travel route. Travel route is identified by its origin and destination. Uh, in our table, we'll have two columns that will both will be part of the primary key and we will define the primary key using the primary key option in the create table call. The model itself can stay empty because Rails by convention will be able to derive the primary key from schema, which make the model behave the following way. The primary key will return the all columns uh, composite primary key consists of. The ID method will return the full identifier, which is an array con containing the, all the values of respective composite primary key columns. The find method will start accepting the full identifier uh, of your model, and methods like reload, update, delete will both use all parts of the composite primary key when performing queries. Uh, however, there is a special use case when it comes to implementing composite primary keys, which we expect to be really common for tables that, are, that started as a tables with a single uh, column primary key and then considered migrating to a composite one. For example, here we have a comments table that has an auto-incremented ID column, but it also has a blog ID. And for performance reasons, we decided to build a composite primary key based on two columns. This makes our column model, comment uh, model behave in the following way. Similarly, to previous model, ID method will return the full identifier that consists of the blog ID and auto-incremented ID that was populated on creation. However, this conflicts with the way we were used to fetching the ID, the value of ID column. And unfortunately, there is only one publicly available way to, uh, to fetch the ID value for this particular model is to split the composite identifier of the model. This happens because Rails treats uh, ID concept as a as a model's identifier and not just uh, as an ID column accessor. Uh, so our recommendation, if possible, avoid having column named ID as part of your composite primary key. And overall, uh, avoid having ID column in your table if you are not intended to use it as a sole single column uh, primary key. To address this issue, Rails on one introduces a new uh, ID column attribute alias called ID value, which provides a way to fetch the value of ID column uh, this regardless of its use or position in the composite primary key. Uh, when it comes to bulk loading of records with a composite primary key, rel one extends the where method uh, with the support of query by tuple syntax, uh, which looks like a hash with the keys and values Values are, are tuples of composite identifiers of models. For our travel route model, it will look like this, where we have a hash with origin destination and unique identifier of each travel route, whether it's A to C, B to C, or B to D. And it's, uh, the, the use of the new syntax is pretty simple. Everyone should be familiar with that. When it comes to associating a model with a composite primary key, RHEL 7.1 introduces a query constraints option in every association to serve as a composite foreign key. To extend our example, let's create a travel route reviews table, which has a route origin and route destination columns, which will serve as a composite foreign key. In order to define an association to the travel route, we will define a regular belongs to association along with passing query constraints and an array, eff effectively telling the association to use both of the columns as a composite foreign key, while the composite primary key of the travel route will be derived automatically. Uh, and yeah, then it will start working as a regular uh, Rails association, active record association. 
in case if your application is not just ready to change the database schema and migrate a composite primary key, uh, so let's look at this example that provides a simplified Shopify setup with an orders table and line items. Uh, the models are pretty simple, where one order uh, has many items, line item belongs to an order. And every table has a shop ID that behaves as a tenant key, uh, determining the association to an online store. Uh, for these purposes, to avoid uh, changing the database schema, RHEL 7.1 introduces the concept of a virtual primary key called query constraints, uh, which allows to mimic the behavior of a composite primary key by defining query constraints macro, specifying all the columns we want to see in every query when it comes to referring to a particular model. Uh, this slide basically shows that the shop ID is included in every query issued by either association uh, from both sides. Uh, you might have noticed that we kept the association as is with no particular or explicit configuration. This is possible because the Rails is capable of deriving the query constraints on associations, but only when query constraints on the model itself has a special shape and composed of the tenant or sharding key and the primary key from the database schema. All right, let's recap this section. Uh, Active Record 7.1 provides native support for composite primary keys. Uh, usage of ID column, preferably you should avoid using ID column for anything other than a single column primary key. Uh, however, if you end up doing that or you don't wanna tweak your database schema uh, just yet, you can use the query constraints as a virtual primary key, uh, which can be particularly useful in a multi-tenant uh, sharding application. All right, we're, we're getting closer to the conclusion. Uh, the main idea I want to, you to remember that the use that you should use your composite primary key based your, on your database needs. Ensure it's suitable for your database, and Rails will support it. So to recap a few key concepts. You should be considering using composite primary key when having a separate single column identifier is unnecessary or excessive, like joint tables, or in the multi-tenant application when you're willing to trade off insertion rate uh, in favor of uh, getting a faster query selects and updates. You may want to consider using query constraints or a virtual primary key in a multi-tenant application to include the tenant key in SQL queries, whether for data separation or as a preparation for sharding, or just to completely redefine the columns being used in queries like, uh, in operations like update, reload, and delete. As a general reminder, if, if, if you end up using the feature and you find any bugs and issues, please report it to GitHub issues tracker, but for this, uh, discussions, proposals, ideas, uh, Discord or discourse will be more appropriate. I'd like to thank all these great people helping me uh, develop this feature, bouncing ideas, contributing documentation, features, rejecting dummy ideas. Uh, thank you. And thank you for listening.